welcome to What is Gender? My name is Sandy Starr and I work for the Progress Educational Trust. Time was when the question, what is gender, might have seemed a very strange question outside of specialist circles and, you know, latterly activist circles. Gender has been a concept widely assumed, uh, not, not necessarily universally assumed, but widely assumed, to map neatly onto the fact that there are two main types of human reproductive apparatus biologically speaking, and most of us are born with one or the other. And it was once the case that if you wanted to argue that gender wasn't as straightforward as that, then that could land you in real trouble. And if you were saying that your own gender was not as straightforward as all that, that's still true in many parts of the world. But it's equally true in many parts of the Western world that you can now get in a whole lot of trouble for saying that you think gender is or should be a straightforward matter. You can get in trouble for challenging or just questioning the terms on which gender is discussed. And if you question the account someone gives of their own gender or the gender of their children, then that can land you in real trouble. So th things have definitely changed, and I'm sure we'll be debating what has changed and how and why, in the way gender is discussed. But it remains the case that talking and thinking freely about gender uh, is a perilous endeavour. Now, this is the Battle of Ideas Festival. Talking and thinking freely and perilous endeavours is what we are all about. So there is no idea that's unacceptable or off the table. Let's see if we can unpick this subject. We've got a panel of distinguished speakers, and I'll need your help as well. Things may get heated, but I hope we can generate as much light as heat. Uh, and we're very fortunate, I'll introduce you to the speakers in the order in which they're going to speak. We're very fortunate to have as our first speaker uh, on my far right, uh, one of the world's leading experts on the biology of sex, Professor Robin Lovell Badge. Robin is head of stem cell biology and developmental genetics at the Francis Crick Institute. And just over 25 years ago, his laboratory discovered one of the key genes that's principally responsible for sex determination in humans? Uh, most mammals. In most mammals, including humans. So when it comes to the biology of sex, he knows whereof he speaks. And he'll tell us what sex means, biologically speaking. He might challenge us to reconsider some of our assumptions on the matter. And that will leave us, hopefully, better placed to discuss and debate whether we think gender means or should mean something different. And that brings me to our second speaker on my immediate right, Professor Marilyn Stratham, who is one of the world's leading experts on the anthropology of gender. Marilyn is Emeritus Professor of Social Anthropology at the University of Cambridge and the author of many books related to this subject. But one of the main reasons I really invited Marilyn to speak is because I was very interested in her, her latest book and one of her earliest books. Because Marilyn originally wrote this book in the early 1970s under the title Men and Women during the ferment of, of sexual liberation and women's liberation. But it's only just been published for the first time this year under a new title, Before and After Gender, Sexual Mythologies of Everyday Life. I may have preferred the original title. <laughs> um, but Marilyn's very well placed to tell us not just about the ideas in this book, but about what has changed in the four decades between the time that she wrote it and the time that it's been published. Moving across, uh, on my immediate left, uh, we're going to have Dr. Terry Murray, who's Director of Studies at Hampstead College of Fine Arts and Humanities. And Terry has written perceptively on this subject for various publications, and she too has an interesting book out, Thinking Straight About Being Gay, Why It Matters If We're Born That Way. Helps to have a rhyming title to make it memorable. <laughs> It's a book about how our ideas of what is natural relate to sexual orientation, but it's also very useful for thinking about how our ideas of what is natural relate to gender. Because it's worth remembering, historically speaking, that just as the distinction between sex and gender is actually quite a recent distinction, actually the idea that those things are distinct from sexual orientation and that all these different attributes can vary independently of one another, that's actually quite a recent idea as well. Last but by no means least, on my far left, spatially, possibly politically, 
<laughs> we have Chrissy Daz, who is a school teacher and a cabaret performer who performs both in and out of drag. One of the most incisive and interesting thinkers and writers I know on this topic, he also has a fascinating book on the subject, but we can't read it and I can't hold it up because it's still in his head and on his desk because he's still writing it. So I look forward to being able to read it and, and hold it up, but until then, we're going to have to make do with Chrissy explaining his ideas in person and perhaps you can help him develop them as well. And they're going to speak for five to seven minutes each. I will keep them to time and I'll bring the audience in uh, as soon as possible. So to start us off, Robin, what is sex? <laughs> Um, so well, when, we, when we consider the basis of sex and gender, at least the way I view it, we have, we have differences in anatomy and physiology, you want those together largely, uh, gender role, uh, gender preference and gender identity. And I personally view each of these as sort of separate U-shaped well, curves or, or spectra where, where uh, the majority of people will be either clear male or clear female ends of these curves. But, of course, they're going to be some at any point in between. Um, and this is true of, of physical sex as, as well as uh, issues about gender. So what, for while the majority, um, of the four of these will also coincide, there is considerable independence uh, between each of them, um, beca perhaps because the mechanisms involved may be different, uh, and they're not necessarily coupled with each other, and we can get onto that later. So of the four, we probably understand the physical differences the best, and this is the topic I was asked to address. So just, um, it's a really long, complex topic, and uh, I've been known to give talks for four hours on this, rather than four Please minutes. don't do that, Robbie. <laughs> uh, so, but just briefly, thinking about the physical differences between males and females. So you have the gonads, which are obviously either ovaries or testes. Um, during embryonic development, how, whether you get an ovary or testis is largely a choice of cell fate. So you have cells which are bipotential, they can do one thing or another, and it's which direction they go in that decides whether you have, end up with ovaries or testes. And I'll explain that in a bit more in a second. You have the reproductive tract, um, so internal structures, which is, so that's a largely a choice of um, which of two independent structures to keep. So we all begin developing with both and then you eliminate one or the other. Uh, external genitalia, again, we all begin with the same um, structure, if you like, and then it's patterned differently in males and females. Uh, and then brain and behaviour, probably it's a combination of all of those mechanisms, or each of those mechanisms, plus other influences. So we're usually destined to be male or female, uh, depending on whether we inherit a Y chromosome from our our fathers, or an X chromosome from our fathers. However, for the first six weeks of development, uh, we all look pretty, the embryo looks pretty much the same, whether it's XX or XY. It's this, at this point when the gonads begin to develop. Um, and if you have, I'd say also at this point, you have the structures for the internal genitalia and the external genitalia beginning to form. Um, everything is very finely balanced. Uh, including in the developing gonads. Uh, but if the, if the Y chromosome is present, and specifically this one gene on the Y chromosome called SRY, um, then that gene turns on and it initiates the process of testis differentiation. It acts with it within one specific cell type um, called, in, called a supporting cell precursor, and its role is to just to influence, in a more or less subtle way, in fact, the activity of particularly one autosomal gene called SOX9. So it's a gene on a normal chromosome. And it just, what its role is to boost the activity of that one gene. When that one gene uh, uh, starts to get to a high level of, of activity, it then triggers a whole series of things. So it's actually the gene that does most of the work to make a testis, but it's on an autosome. The SRY gene is actually a pathetic, rather male gene. So it's asleep, it wakes up, it gives an order, and it goes back to sleep again. So it's only active in the mouse gonads, in that particular cell type in the mouse gonads, for a few hours. It really does, that's all it's doing, is nudging um, a very fine balance in the direction of, let's say, we are going to make a test just now. Um, the SOX9 gene, when it's active, it... it um, 
There are several things. It triggers mechanisms that maintains its own activity at a high level. It triggers the differentiation of these cells into Sertoli cells. So these are the cells that eventually in the adult testes nurture and support the process of making sperm. And it also triggers events that are going to make the rest of the gonad follow the male pathway and make a testis. Um, if the Y chromosome isn't there, or specifically if the SLY gene is not, is not active, it's all not there, then um, ovary development ensues. Now, it used to be referred to often as even a, a default pathway, which is a horrible term to use. That's absolutely not the case. We know that making ovaries is, a, is an active process uh, with specific genes having a very critical active role. Um, but again, what happens is that you, once you initiate this process of making an ovary, which occurs actually in the same initial cell type, this bipotential cell type that can make Sertoli cells in the testes, in the ovary, they make follicle cells or granulosa cells, which end up supporting the, the, the developing eggs. It's this fine balance to begin with, and then it's, it's specifically what happens at the very early stages, this tips that balance in the favor of making testis or ovary, once the initial genes start being active, they then trigger a whole cascade of things that reinforce that initial decision. Um, so one of the things, of course, that a testis does fairly early on is start making uh, the male hormone testosterone, and makes a couple of other factors as well, which we can talk about later if necessary, but it makes other, particularly testosterone, and its main role is to uh, effectively export the male signal from the developing testis to the rest of the developing embryo. And testosterone is known to have effects on the development of the male reproductive tract, uh, on external genitalia, of course, and all the other secondary sexual characteristics, probably also the brain, or well, definitely also the brain. Um, in the ovary, uh, of course, we'll start making estrogens at some point. It's actually quite late in, in embryonic development. Um, and that estrogen levels are important for um, reinforcing uh, decisions to be female, if you like, the cells have to take. This is a very simplistic view. There are other things that are, that are important. So one is that we know that there are, even though it, it looks like it becomes rapidly all hardwired and you're definitely going to be male, you definitely have testes or ovaries. Um, uh, we did an experiment a couple of years ago where we mutated a gene that's critical for, with, for ovary development called FOXL2. If you delete this gene from an adult female mouse, its ovaries start turning into testes. So things are not that fixed. And then the final point is, I've been telling you the sort of central dogma, if you like, the central part of it. There are also, of course, other genes on the Y chromosome and also on X chromosomes that we know can influence aspects of sex, sex differentiation. So uh, we have to bear all those in mind. Thank you very much, Robin. The, these genetic uh, attributes initiate but do not foreclose your... It, it, your... Seem, it seems that we retain flexibility yes. in some, to some extent, which yes. depends on the activity of specific key genes. Yes. And this, this actually may relate to evolutionary aspects, which we can talk about later, okay. because, of course, there are some species that change sex. Okay. And uh, thank you very much, Robin. Marilyn, I suspect you'll have rather a different perspective on this topic. But that was really illuminating. But we're going to continue the story in another register. Uh, you'll be familiar with, with it, I think. The modern sense of the term gender was invented in the early 1970s, and it then seemed a solution to a lot of puzzles. One couldn't put down to sex all the differences that people saw between men and women. There was the huge variety of social roles that men and women played. There were also the way the differences between them spun off into metaphors, stereotypes, ideas about relations. That was obvious well before gender was invented as a term, of course. We have medieval poems debating the positive and negative attributes of women, 19th century property and inheritance laws that made married women wards of their husbands and so forth. Of everything one could point to in this forum, I start with gender as a relation and a relation between the ideas people have when they differentiate men and women. We might think of it as a language that organizes ideas. Let me give you some examples. Gender is a boundary that is also a meeting point. Like the rope 
that divides off the male and female areas of a pastoralist's homestead in Nigeria. Men focus on cattle, women focus on milk and marketing. Gender is a contrast that is also an analogy as between red and black. When on ceremonial occasions, New Guinea women paint their faces red just as men paint their faces black. Gender is an exclusion that defines something as important, like the huge effort it was to get girls' schools as opposed to boys' schools established in the 19th century. Gender is an inevitability to be protected from choice, as in ethical arguments over assisted reproduction, where embryo sex selection is off limits. That ratio must take a natural course. When the focus is on difference, difference can inevitably or is inevitably used as a justification for discrimination, as Simone de Beauvoir saw so clearly. But there's something else. Where gender is a language for organizing ideas about men and women, it's a language that can also use the characteristics of men and women to talk about other things. The relation between nature and culture, for example, Think of the way we build this into our explanations. When we talk of gender as the social or cultural construction of biological facts, for instance, we mean that what people make of their biology, and this may be another way of talking about sex, can vary widely. There are, of course, many societies in the world who have very definite gender constructs, but don't have a theory of the natural or biological origins of human behavior. They still use male and female to talk about differences, complementarities, social distinctions, and so forth, as in the examples I gave. But this all points up to just how wedded we are, not just to natural explanations, but to a binary division or dualism between nature and culture. That is, social and cultural life is to be understood principally as a response to natural circumstances. And if I were looking for a history of Western ideas about gender, I would start with that dualism nature and culture. There have been battles of ideas over which takes precedence in explaining things, a battle that is engaged in many registers with a long history in Western thought, but re-engaged in the Enlightenment, a time of capital accumulation, of shifting notions of domesticity, of a new emphasis on the conjugal family, in a way that marked relations between men and women. So when gender becomes a way of talking about other things, such as nature and culture, the battleground becomes persons and their bodies. That embodiment means that people are the carriers and registers of such ideas. It affects how they think of themselves, of who they are, and has direct consequences on lives. And as Judith Butler has reiterated, it's the binary construction of the idea of gender that can be problematic. So let me leave you with this. If in Western thought, gender is bound up with the emphasis we put on biology or human creativity, on nature or culture, on genetics or nurture, it's not a battle that can be won for two reasons. First, gender invites us to think beyond persons and bodies. What matters is how we exist in the world at large, our ecology, for how human beings relate to the world will affect, for better or worse, the way they relate to one another an argument very similar to those of the Marxist feminists in the early days of women's liberation. If you want to lift women's oppression, you have to understand the very conditions of oppression. Second, and I think many anthropologists will take this view, it's the dualism that is the problem. The idea that nature and culture are somehow external to each other. Rather, of course, they're deeply implicated, and at that point, one would even question the terms. The dual, the binary, this is a matter of how ideas are organized. And insofar as gender works as a relation between such ideas, maybe we can also work with it to rethink them. Thank, Thank you. you. We've heard uh, from Marilyn uh, about how gender, as we now use the term, uh, was invented to serve particular uh, purposes. And I'm <coughs> interested to hear from Terry and Chrissy whether they think it still serves those purposes well if, if indeed it ever did. Over to you, Terry. For me, sex is between your legs, and it's a given. And gender is the ideas about biology that we carry 
that are part of our cultural inheritance. So I'm sure if you're here today, you've probably heard that riddle about a father and son. They get into a car accident. They're, the father dies instantly. The son is rushed to hospital. And the surgeon looks at the boy and says, I can't operate on him. He's my son. And if you're stumped by this, then gender is very deeply ingrained in your thinking because you must think that surgeons must be male. But this is a huge part of our inheritance that it becomes so common sense that it just seems natural. So we have this kind of merging of what is a construct, uh, what is contingent, what is historically transient. Um, this sort of is treated as though it were part of the actual natural world. So that when I think of millionaire, it's a gendered term. That's why I have to say female millionaire to distinguish that from millionaire. If I think of the word nurse or slut, that is a gendered term. I have to say, oh, I meant a male slut. <laughs> so I want to just uh, comment on how gender or why gender matters and um, what difference it makes. So we, like I said, we, we tend to naturalize these gender differences and we see them as essential biological sex differences or at least manifestations of those differences. So the prevailing belief, belief then is that uh, the current way that our culture is organized with division of labor between the sexes in our society uh, or you know, what it means to act like a man or to dress like a man, that somehow uh, this has some kind of underlying biological necessity. So from a just gender perspective, we could say, well, why does sexism persist? Why does patriarchy persist? Now, there could be two possible answers. One is because certain institutions and agents within those institutions who have a vested interest in preserving patriarchy uh, choose to do so. And they do so through many different institutions, whether religion, Hollywood, etc. Or we could say that it is an inevitable product of biology, fixed by our biological differences, determined by our genes. Now, this is going to, of course, depoliticize it. And that's why I think we need to be very wary of this. So biological determinist theories basically suggest that occupying leader leadership roles in public or religious or cultural life just goes with being a male, just like having a penis, testicles, or facial hair. So the kind of general structure of the biological determinist argument, it takes different forms throughout history. But first, there'll be some sort of citation of evidence. We'll look at, look, this is what men generally do. This is what women generally do. And then we'll say that these facts sort of depend on some prior psychological tendencies that are male or female. And these, are, in turn, are then explained uh, with reference to an underlying biological difference at the level of brain structure or hormones. Next, we'll start to draw some parallels between non-human species and human species based on the assumption that they're pretty much the same and that there's no distinguishing feature of human nature that would separate us. And then finally, we have this sociobiological Panglossian arguments that sexual divisions emerged adaptively by natural selection. And so whatever the world is like, it's both highly functional and it's optimal. It's the best of all possible worlds. So the sort of propagandists of gender or of patriarchy sort of see an unbroken line between uh, the androgen binding sites in the brain, the rough and tumble play of male infants, and then male domination of the state, the industry, and nuclear family. But is this the kind of level of explanation 
that's helpful? I would say no. There are other explanations for why these social institutions are what they are. Economic explanations, political explanations, um, not genetic fatalism. Now, when it comes to sexual orientation, um, homosexuality has, of course, been conceptualized in different ways, at different times in history, in different cultures. Uh, everyone's familiar with Foucault's argument, of course, that the homosexual as a type is a product of cultural determinism or of some kind of heteronormativity <laughs> that was part of a social mythology fashioned by psychoanalysts in the 19th century. Um, most of my work has been around um, the religious construction of sexuality and, of course, they didn't really acknowledge a homosexual person until really about 1975, at least in the Judeo-Christian Western tradition. Um, instead, the homosexual was always envisioned as someone who was rebelling against universal human nature, which was just generically heterosexual. And again, the explanation was a biological determinist one. You simply look at the functions of the reproductive organs, and you can easily just read off them their purpose. Their purpose is obviously procreation. So you can see God's designs, God's purposes, his will in the things that have been made. Of course, this is a very selective uh, view of the things that have been made. And this is the problem with all of these forms of sort of naturalist biological determinism, is that they tend to be very highly selective of some feature of the natural world and treat that as important to the exclusion of other features, such as the fact that we are creative beings. We are so, meaning makers. Thank you, Terry. Chrissy, what do you think? Okay, well, I think we're in, living in interesting times. I'm not sure how many people might have heard of this. It was not sort of uh, blazoned across the headlines, but within the last few months, America has now become the 10th country in the world to recognise non-binary as a gender identity. Uh, two examples. Um, first, in June, June in Oregon, um, a person... I have to use that term carefully... Uh, ..by the name of Jamie Shoup, who was originally a man... Uh, decided to, to transition, become a transsexual woman, and then at some point along that process decided that's not really uh, what he wants to be either, uh, and went to the court to ask to have his driver's licence, or I should say their driver's licence, um, to uh, registered as non-binary. And, uh, and the courts agreed, and so subsequently another person, in this case uh, an intersex person, decided to, to follow suit in California, and there are several other cases look set to, to be making the same uh, demands on the, on the legal system in America. So that's interesting. As I say, that, that is, that America is now the 10th country to do this in one form or another. Other countries have, for instance, removed the need for stating um, either male or female on, on, on various documents. Uh, other countries have allowed... Um, intersex babies to be registered as, uh, as neither male nor female. Um, and several other countries have uh, introduced a third gender as, as a third option. Uh, I think largely what's driving this is the states themselves. It's the sort of on, a, on a, 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 an international, supranational uh, level where, for instance, one country will, will bring in a gender recognition act, and they will, get, they will be careful to make sure theirs is that little bit more liberal, if you want to use that word, uh, than another's. So, for instance, Argentina in 2006 made um, it possible to change your gender without having any medical um, uh, expert uh, input. It was purely self-declaratory. Since then, countries like, um, well, other countries have followed suit. Uh, countries like Norway have now allowed people as young as six to, to uh, as with parental consent to change gender. And I think in some states in America, children can change gender without their parental uh, consent. So that's all quite interesting. I think what this throws up for me is, what is this concept of non-binary and where does this come from? And I think to, to try and get to grips with that, we need to, uh, to, to realise that 
there have been a couple of really quite significant paradigm shifts within little more than a generation. So if we go back to the, uh, the early 70s, I think everybody, whatever their position, whether they were sort of um, reactionary, biological determinist, um, uh, anti-feminist, whether Marxist feminist, or every, everyone else, was agreed that essentially, while gender might be many things, the, the, the central point of it, the, the, the main point, was that it was about the sexual division of labour. It was about... Um, yeah, how society organises economically to share out the, the, the paid productive work from the unpaid reproductive work. That clearly shifted, I, th I would say in the 80s it was quite clear that that had gone for a number of reasons. Partly, I think, because um, it was no longer as hard and fast as that. The reality was that far more women were, were going out to work, far more men were sharing the, uh, the burden of housework. Um, also, I think because generally the idea of economics and our positions and relationships on that scale, that macro scale, were not throwing up the potential to radically transform society the way that perhaps previously many people had thought. So we started to think of gender in terms of interpersonal relationships, in terms of men's sexuality being a problem for women to do with um, the relationships of bonding, uh, uh, particularly male bonding, uh, causing problems in terms of homophobic responses, and uh, everything was, to, was, was seen in those sort of interpersonal terms. But I think the, th the second paradigm shift, so the third paradigm which we're starting to, um, to have to come to terms with, sees gender not in terms of relationships of any sort, really. It is a mood more than anything else. It is... Uh, something which is just a deep-seated sense. I feel that this is my gender. Um, to, one example, just to sort of illustrate this, the definition of agender from uh, nonbinary.org. I might read a few of, more of these out later. People find that they have no inner sense of their gender identity. That is, they have no gender. So it's as red. It's your inner sense that decides. That's it. That's, that's the, um, the only thing it relates to. Curiously... While clearly this gives us a sort of very ephemeral and ineffable sort of sense of what gender is, we also, because gender is not necessarily understood as something you're born with uh, in your genes or whatever, it is something which I think Judith Butler's um, um, hypothesis is widely understood, if not from first-hand sources, uh, and agreed with, that it's the performativity which produces this. So... Um, as Judith Butler herself put it, gender is a kind of imitation for which there is no original. In fact, it's a kind of imitation that produces the very notion of the original as an effect and a consequence of the imitation itself. So there's nothing generating this, really. And I think it gives a, a sort of um, an ecosystem um, vision of what society is about, where there are different identities coming into conflict, sometimes combining in different ways. At the same time, there's an obsession with trying to categorise all of this. So we start off with two genders. According to, to um, Anne Fausto Sterling, who did a lot of work with intersex, there, there should be five genders related to five sexes, because as well as male and female, there are also hermaphrodites. There are true hermaphrodites who are genuinely almost difficult, to, very difficult to decide whether they're more male or female, and then there are male hermaphrodites who are slightly more male, female. So she calls them firms, merms, and herms. So you've got five genders corresponding to those. When you bring in trans and cis, there's a second dimension into that. I worked out you end up with 11 different genders because you can be a, a trans firm or a, a, a cis firm or, or, or whatever. Um, then, of course... Given that I think that sexuality has been re-understood as being in the same sort of same sort of thing, so um, gay, lesbian, and the LGBT has now become LGBTQIAP and a plus sign at the end in case we've forgotten anything out, uh, anything else. So that's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning, sometimes queer, uh, intersex, asexual, pansexual. 
plus we might have forgotten something. So you end up with, with a massive sort of proliferation of genders. And just to finish, I'm just going to yep. read, out, read out a couple of examples um, of these type of genders. I'm not sure how, how much you're supposed to take these seriously, but there is something serious underlying it. Um, a query gender. This is a gender that is perpetually changing. It's, it's never a specific gender identity, but sometimes there are existing labels that are close to what the gender feels like at the time. Sometimes it changes to a completely inexplicable feeling. A query gender is a flowing gender that changes slowly and constantly. It is not a set amount of genders um, that switches between. It is infinite. And I'll just read one more. Quickly. My favourite. Schrode gender which is a gender which you can both feel and not feel, and also a single gender that exists as if it were many genders at once. Thank you. Can we thank our speakers? I'd like uh, to put you under some scrutiny, Robin. I was under the impression you might define biological sex and, and leave, uh, leave the rest up to us, but you were quite, um, you, you asserted your authority. You know, everything is in the domain of natural science. Gender identity, gender this, gender that, and then you can find your comments uh, to one of these things, which is a, obviously a contrast or a tension between that and Terry's position on sort of uh, uh, determinism, biological determinism. Now, uh, if it's the case, as, as it is, that referrals to gender identity clinics mm -hmm. are soaring in this country, uh, and they are, they've gone up by several hundred percent in the last 10 years, services are under strain, etc. Um, I wonder whether, from your perspective, uh, that's due to a hitherto unrecognised or underappreciated biological phenomenon that we're now getting to grips with, or is something else happening that's completely outside the domain of your laboratory? Uh, you want a short answer? Oh my gosh. Um, it, it, so I'm, I'm challenging your assertion that this is in, all in the domain of natural science, potentially. Well, I'm not sure I quite understand that, that challenge, because I'm, well, you know, clearly there are things which are, are, have a, a biological, perhaps determinist origins, but it um, doesn't necessarily mean that things are going to be fixed. So, mm. as I said, genetically you can by deleting a single gene, change uh, an ovary into something like a testis, and you can do actually the same thing the other way around. You can change mm -hmm. testis to an ovary if you want one. Right. Sandy. I'll, I'll pass it. <laughs> um, and I suspect the same is true. So I, I, as I was trying to suggest for, if you like, the biological sex, um, you start off with, you know, some minute little change, which then gets amplified, and it gets amplified by a number of ways. The same is true, um, probably, if in, in terms of gender um, identity, gender role, gender preference. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's fixed immediately. It can be start off along a pathway which is then flexible. Right? It's a biological pathway, though. It's a, there's a, there may be a biological... I mean, we know, we know, for example, that gender role, so whether you, you know, behave masculine or feminine, is influenced by exposure of to androgens at uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, late fetal stages and maybe a, you know, shortly after birth. There's very good, strong evidence for that, right? So, um, but things get reinforced, and they get reinforced by your environment socially. So, what you, so that's what I mean. So okay. Yes. Well, I'll, I'll bring you in, Marilyn. That's very interesting what we've just heard, you know, um, because the thing about environment uh, is that it's a way of bringing human relations and society, again, into a natural scientific way of talking. I was very interested that you spoke of the counterposition of nature and culture, because um, often nowadays actually the counterposition that's used is nature and nurture, which is originally from the, the Tempest. Um, and nature and culture seems to me to be, have a more transcendent quality. It doesn't necessarily confine us to what we've just heard. My argument was in part that we need to look at the way these ideas are constructed and held together. And what holds together the notion of male and female, or men and women, is precisely the binary divide. It's the, div it's the division that holds those two terms. That division, I mean, like your, like your biological reinforcement, that division is culturally reinforced in numerous, numerous ways, and um, um, Terry, spoke to, sp Terry spoke to some of them, including, I think, something that is very deep-seated in the way we inquire into the relationship between human beings and the world around them. 
And we can talk of humans and environment, we can talk of nature and culture, we can talk of nature and nurture in a, in a, in a, in a narrower way. Uh, but what we have to have to, have to confront, really, is just how much needs to be unpicked before um, we can start uh, uh, addressing that particular relationship between male and female. Okay. Terry, um, in light of what you've said, what do you make of the fact that, for example, in Norway, someone as young as six can now change their legal gender without any need for medical intervention or therapy and as it was reported earlier this week is it, it is as easy as filling in your tax return hmm. is this a is this a good thing is it a suspicious thing what's going on uh, i think it's a suspicious thing the gendering of children of course the gendering of children takes place within a society in which we're already steeped in gender so the idea that the child is behaving abnormally takes for granted what, what is normal for men or for males or for females. So, um, also, I think that the whole idea that uh, a child can understand why they feel what they feel or even what gender is, I feel like you've got to be an adult before you know what gender means and how the culture has influenced you to think what you do about yourself. Uh, so your unhappiness, I would see as not necessarily something intrinsic in you, in your biology, but a relationship between you and a culture that is steeped in gender stereotypes. Okay, thank you. Chrissy, do you think that's right that gender dysphoria it isn't ultimately, can't be intrinsic to a child, or do you have a different take on it? Well, I think that um, it's very, di I think we were talking about a different thing when we are talking about childhood, because I think that the way that gender operates in childhood, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great significance to the cognitive development uh, in terms of developing the tools, the cognitive tools, to be able to categorise, to, to generalise, to separate, uh, to essentialise. And children are learning how to do that at the same time that they are learning what gender is, which is why, you know, um, the common expression that children are gender detectives, that they are, they're the ones that say, you can't do that because that's a girl's thing, because they've seen one girl eating an apple for instance, and therefore think, well, if I'm a boy, I better not eat an apple because that might, 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 might turn me into a girl. So we have to be very, very, you know, sort of clear and suspicious that children, and you can, all, you can understand how children, while they're playing with this and developing these schemas and these systems, they might end up categorising themselves almost by accident, arbitrarily, uh, in the wrong uh, set, as it were, uh, and it can be a serious problem. It can be a problem which, in adulthood, um, uh, transition is the most suitable um, solution to that, but not necessarily. That's the problem. It's the, the, it's, it, 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 we can't start to go down a route where, soon as any child starts to display any um, sense that they're not really quite happy with the gender they were assigned at birth, that therefore that they, the only thing to do is is to go down that route and to start persecuting um, uh, therapists who might question that. That presumption is very, very dangerous indeed, I think. I'm going to bring the audience in. Yes, have you purposefully avoided reproduction to avoid complicating things? Because you're talking about the creation of the initial individual human being, but there's an additional layer of complication here when we come to actually reproduce a new generation of human beings, surely. And, you know, the, the fact of the necessity of some kind of minimal heterosexuality in, or not a heterosexual act in order to, generally speaking, create that new generation. So are you leaving it off the table because it just makes a mess of things or, or is there another thing going on? If, as you say, there's so many genders, I think now on Facebook you can, there's 71 or something you can mm -hmm. choose from, um, then doesn't, come, I don't understand why gender doesn't almost go out of the window and we're just individuals. So there's that thing, and then at the same time, as there's all this plethora of genders, there seems to be this drive to um, make our biology 
match what we think of, but there aren't 71 biolog biological forms. Uh, so I just don't quite understand what, what's going on there. For, for Professor Level Badge, on Wikipedia, uh, it, we are now informed that there are, there are three sexes. There's, there's male, female, and there's intersex. So intersex has become a category separate from male and female as a category of sex. But it doesn't actually say uh, what is the category between uh, male and intersex, or indeed the category between that category and, and male. So I just wonder if there's a confusion of boundary uh, or uh, fuzziness and categories and whether intersex or what I think really should be disorders of sexual development should, are thought of as a category. I just I wanted to sort of raise whether gender identity is actually how much people care about gender and their actual gender identity because I'm biologically female and I'm 39 weeks pregnant tomorrow and I dress to suit my shape, I'm functionally <laughs> heterosexual but I'm actually gendered male online routinely, I'm asked my preferred pronouns and the first piece of short fiction I ever published was Hard Military SF about big guns, which I love writing, I write a lot of Tom Clancy style thrillers. Now for me the social differences I experience are predominantly due to my biology um, and not actually um, anything to do with my behaviour. Um, and for me, therefore, I sort of say, well, I'm biologically female. I'm providing the uterus in my relationship. But um, so romantic. I think that it's... <laughs> but certainly, um, I don't really think about my gender identity as such. And I never say that I was agender or, or say that I was anything else. I'm just, well, whatever. Um, so I just wondered whether it, it was how much people cared. In regards to gender language, is it possible to gender language. The language of French has masculine and feminine words, um, pronouns. Is it a case of that we take gender out of language or we, or we expand language to include the new gender pluralism that we have? Okay. So my question is why doesn't having 71 different gender categories kind of feel better than it does? So when Simone de Beauvoir wrote that one wasn't born but becomes a woman, it felt like a very uh, liberatory move because she wasn't denying any biological reality. And my, my reading of her work is that she's not denying any biological reality, but she's arguing that who you become, you don't have to be constrained by your biology, you don't have to be constrained by society, and it felt very freeing, very liberating. Um, whereas it seems now that, now that we've got even more options available to us and now that we're able to deny the underlying biology and the connection between sex and gender, actually we seem more constrained and less free. And I'm just wondering why this is the case. I mean, it seems, for one thing, the emphasis on performance and the emphasis on a feeling that's innate, that we all have to invest huge amounts of time in kind of navel-gazing and examining what our innate feelings are and kind of acting out this performance. And it just seems to be a very conservative and regressive move. Thank you. I'm going to come back to the panel and then I'll go back out to the audience. Just to remind people, we've got on the table reproduction, the, the, the biological fact of reproduction. Um, we've got whether gender is, a, a, or whether sex, or one or both, is a spectrum, whether it fits into discrete categories, um, whether it's possible to de-gender language. Uh, and this, you know, Simone de Beauvoir's point, which was reiterated by Monique Wittig, that one is not born a woman, i.e. it's where you take it to, not where you take it from, uh, that counts in life. Um, who would like to start? Why don't I start with, um, so well, first of all, reproduction. Obviously, it's necessary, otherwise the species wouldn't um, survive very long. Um, so there are, must be evolutionary pressures to make sure that uh, at least a significant proportion of any species are you know, heterosexual and capable of reproduction, um, unless, of course, it's a species which uh, reproduces parthenogenetically, which we don't. Yet. So, yet, but who knows. So, so clearly, yeah, but... I mean, again, I don't think I don't. I think it's useful to think of that. I mean, obviously, you have to have males and females having sex to have babies; otherwise, they wouldn't be humans anymore. Um, but I, I, I think that's adding. I mean, that's a, a biological necess necessity. But it, I, I'm not sure how much it really plays in terms of gender and, and those sorts of concepts. With respect to um, definitions of intersex, for example, uh, and the 71 categories of, of gender. I mean, I started when I gave my presentation, I personally think that you, you, it's sort of ridiculous in a way having specific categories because each of the, the four variables are, is, a, is a spectrum or a, a curve. And you, anyone can be any point on any of those four curves all at once. So is it then useful? What? 
having... Is it useful to have categories if they can be permutated that exhaustively? I, I personally don't think it is terribly useful, except, you know, it, it's, uh, in some respects it's necessary for people... People want to know where they are, so that's important. Um, it's some type, for some cases, and certainly the intersex conditions, clinically it's important to know, know what the cause of, of the condition, the, your uh, disorder of, of, of sex development, um, which so, some people actually find that the word disorder um, not very helpful either, and it should just be differences of, of sex development, because you shouldn't really call something a disorder necessarily because these are perfectly functioning people. So the type of, uh, if you like, genetic cause of a DSD um, is relevant clinically, so it's important to, to know, but there are certainly many different types. The, word, and the use of the word intersex was developed because people didn't like the use of the word hermaphrodite. And then, um, so that hermaphrodite was objected to, particularly by the communities of people who are intersex. And they proposed that name, and there's, you know, there are societies like North America. There's the Intersex Society of North America. And they campaigned for their, for their rights. And they can be quite a, aggressive campaigners. Um, so that's probably why that definition exists, why that it's in Wikipedia that you have that. But again, you have this whole range, and it depends what's, what's, what's happened. So you can have sex of a complete sex reversal, where you have individuals who are XX males or XY females. You can have partial sex reversal, which can mean that they can have uh, over testes, or they can over, over on one side testes or another. They can be, and, and, and all sorts of different things um, can happen in terms of internal genitalia, external genitalia. Okay. Thanks, Robin. I think it's useful to remember what, where the words sex and gender come from. They're both from Latin. Uh, sexus referred to the division between things. Intersex is sort of in between a division. Um, gender, uh, genus, gender comes from genus, the same source as generalised, similarity between things, uh, which suggests going in a direction of very few categories, possibly two categories rather than 72. Two, yeah. um, if we're to speak meaningfully of gender or, or not. Marilyn, did you want to come back on anything? Uh, just very briefly, I think the, the, the discussion's moved in an extremely interesting direction in picking up the whole issue of categorization, including the question as to who, who worries about gender. Anyway, the co issue of cognitive development was raised um, in the, the way we perceive the world. We're forever at once um, focusing on the detail and able to see the wider picture. And that, that capacity um, to, to simultaneously reduce down and to, uh, and to enlarge is the category that's inherent in the practice of simultaneously categorization and realizing that categories work in particular context. Um, I think this is something really quite fundamental to the way we, we perceive. Um, and it is really up, up for us how we distribute that capacity when we're talking about um, citizenship or legal status or, or whatever economic reward or, or, or whatever else. Um, is there anything you would like to come back on? Terry, you asked specifically whether it's possible to de-gender language. I might ask whether it's necessary. I don't know if it's possible or necessary to do that in any way that would be coherent. Because if you say, you know, I can just make up whatever gender I want to be and there are no conditions really whatsoever, then there's really no difference between saying uh, I'm this or that gender and I'm an indeterminate widget. Uh, this becomes an untestable, untestable statement. Um, it has really no content um, because it could mean anything or nothing. So I don't think it's useful to multiply semantics. Um, but going back to the kind of methodology and how I think what's more useful is to keep the terms we've got um, but behave in ways that transgress the beliefs about those terms. Um, so like the methodology of studying children and their gender. If you have children who are behaving in non-stereotypical ways, then that ought to be evidence against the assumptions of your premise. <laughs> um, so you should be changing your beliefs about sex or gender, um, you shouldn't be saying that that child is some sort of aberration. You should be questioning your own premises instead. Chrissy, what do you think? Yeah, on the language point, uh, I mean, 
the 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 non-binary field is is a lot of it is is people who don't have any particular sort of um, reason to relate themselves as being neither male nor female. It's just a choice that I don't want to 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 signal that I'm sexist. Therefore, I will choose that I'm going to be uh, they, their, them pronouns from now on, and everyone else has to respect that. I don't think that that is very useful. I, th I think the language is a complete red herring, really. For instance, I mean, we, we, we know that he uh, is, a, is supposed to be a universal pronoun, um, but we also know that, there's, um, that there is an inherent sexism within the language as it's developed, reflecting the society that we're, where we all came from. Um, but, I'm going to read a quote here as well. This is Mimi Maranucci from her book on why feminism is queer. And she is now talking about the word person. She says, in principle, gender-neutral terms such as person or people refer equally and literally to all people, including transgender and intersex people. In practice, unfortunately, the priority in contemporary US and European culture granted to men, more specifically to heterosexual men, and even more specifically to white, European or North American, formerly educated, upper middle class, able-bodied, Christian heterosexual men, is so deeply entrenched that when it, what comes to mind as the generic person is... Well, that person. Okay, so what that says to me is that you can't win. You know, if you, if you, if you um, decide that you're going to be gender neutral about everything that you say, then someone is going to accuse you of uh, reflecting the, uh, the inherent uh, gender bias, bias, which is in society and it's not really your fault, so I don't really see where we can go with that. Um, a number of people have referred to Facebook 71 gender categories. Now, just to point out, a lot of those are... Preferen different preferences of words, many of which refer to the same thing. Uh, it's impossible to, to count how many genders there are uh, on different websites, different ways of looking at it. Uh, people break it down into different ways. There are some categories, like, for instance, different subcategories of transsexual, or autogynophilia, which is a category which caused uh, a, um, the authors of that, Michael um, Bailey and uh, Ray Blanchard, to be, uh, to be uh, chased out of town effectively by a group of trans activists. But many trans people like that. Many trans people identify as, as autogynophilics. There we go. It's interesting that one of the uh, developers at Facebook who introduced the expanded gender options. It's now been expanded much further instead. It's now totally customizable, at least in America. You can, just, you can literally just choose your own gender on Facebook. Uh, but one of the people who, who uh, developed that is a, a trans woman. Because of Facebook's real names policy, uh, she's not able to use her preferred name. Indeed, the name she was known by in Facebook's offices on the website and is complaining very loudly about this. And I think that throws up a lot of interesting questions and tensions about what we use things like names and gender and attributes to mean. Yeah, go ahead. I have two questions. The first is for Robin. Robin, right at the start when Sandy asked you the first question about why sex referrals have quadrupled or went up by a few hundred percent, <clears throat> I think he was hinting at something. I want to just tease it out. Was he, and this is also for you, Sandy, yeah. were you hinting that Robin's, people like Robin, the biologist, shouldn't have anything to say about that debate? Because really it's not a biological discussion, it's more a sort of a cultural discussion phenomenon. So that's the first question. Mm -hmm. The second question is, at the, um, the paradigm shift which Chrissy introduces, there's, um, there's an awful lot of young people here, and some of them are, are even my own sex formers, and this is a discussion that young students are absolutely massively into, about the definition of your sexual identity or whatever it's called, into 60 or 70 sort of different directions. And most of the young people I speak to, they see this actually, by and large, as a liberation, as a positive thing, because they're coming from a position where they see homosexuals and bisexuals and other people haven't been discriminated against in the past, so they welcome it. And then you have Joe here behind me who spoke, who effectively accuses people who want to define any 70 odd different ways as narcissistic, navel-gazing, self-obsessed. So really, I'm just curious about where the panel situate themselves on that question. I was, I was really worried that you weren't going to get any questions on this panel, Robin, but uh, I'm going <laughs> to ask you one as well. It's the, 
It's the same sort of issue. You seem to be loosening the grip that biological determinism has over sex. And I just want to chase that down as to how far you go with this, because I'm, I'm, are you suggesting that there's no real unity or no real essence to the terms male and female in a biological kind of way? And, and if you are saying that, are you saying that the unity therefore comes from our subjective interpretation of how biology works? Uh, you know, that it's us that is kind of making this stuff up. There's no real unity to these terms. Because if you're saying that, it seems to unreasonably unhinge um, sex from biology. There does seem to be something in it that makes it um, what it is inherently. I think what I want to say is that I'm disappointed so far mm -hmm. to find that I haven't disagreed with anything that anyone has said, <laughs> either on the panel or from the room. And I find that actually very strange, given the fact that, um, that this is an area which we know is extremely difficult to debate. I don't know whether people know that the NSPCC had a series called Dare to Debate, um, which had to be closed down. They proposed a debate between Sarah Dittam of the New Statesman mm -hmm. and Kelly Maloney, a trans woman. We invited Sarah to speak here. Uh, okay, but I think it's fascinating that, um, that it has, that the things that we're talking about here, we are all agreed on, mm -hmm. and yet, I mean, I do think we're absolutely all agreed. I really don't think anything anybody has said I've disagreed with for a single second. It's eminently sensible and utterly right. And yet we live in a world in which, for instance, we have the Conservative government producing, um, using, as, asking the Women and Equalities Committee to produce a report which includes statements such as, includes, well, actually their recommendation co-written with gendered intelligence, which includes a statement from somebody who says, um, a trans woman who says, I have a male body but a female soul. And that ah. kind of statement, which seems to me to be just completely bizarre, um, and which, and, the, and the, we have the repeated invocation of the phrase, born in the wrong body, which also, I simply do not understand. I don't understand what the self is. What is this self? Is it a soul? Is it a spirit? Are we back in the Middle Ages, you know, which inhabits this wrong body and this wrong body, not, not, not my body, but a wrong body, which then needs to be medically changed or altered. So I think we're living in a very strange world with some very strange real world consequences of what is, of course, initially a liberatory movement. But I think the consequences are quite concerning. And I think it's very odd that there is no battle here. Perhaps say something that, will, um, that, that our friend here can disagree with. <laughs> Go ahead, yes. So this is my question for Professor Marinen. After hearing Camille Pallier's speech on feminism, she was speaking about um, that she thought uh, transgender was quite a, a scary concept for young people because it could be just an, another idea of rebellion for our age. Um, and that... Even it is dangerous because it is an irreversible physical change if they do ch um, choose to go um, for gender reassignment therapy. I was wondering what you thought about her ideas that it is a dangerous concept and that it, is, it could be just be the new rebellion for our age. I just find, as you said before, like the, um, people have been making genders up like nearly every week. I mean, um, as you said, 71 genders. I believe that as the original movement was supposed to be more for accepting people and the decisions, but it's gone way past that. I mean, what, what's going, what's going to happen next? I mean, I, I identify as an attack helicopter. I put, I don't, I mean, I don't want to be called him, he, he or you know, I mean, are people going to be moving on to animals next? I mean, mm -hmm. right. Uh, my question is for Terry, and it's about uh, essentialism and the use of generics. I'm concerned on a number of points here, and the first thing is, is uh, the use of gender by a second wave feminist historically seems to be based on the idea of you know, a relation, as, as, as Marilyn says, men, are, or utilising Catherine McKinnon's argument, men are dominant, women are subordinate, and the sex difference, as she specifically defines it, men are powerful, women are powerless. From that, we take a whole bunch of things of what you might call attributes that people attribute to men and to, uh, you know, and to women. We are not now living in the, in the, in the, in the period in 2016 as Becky Frieden was in the 1960s, early 1960s, where women had, from her classes in the 1950s, all engaged and possibly married by the age of 21 and the time they left college. 
So the arg argument that you made about um, if you assume a man is a doctor, if you, if you hear doctor, you assume man, it's uh, you're, you're living in a gender thing. In other words, what you have done is essentialized what basically a doctor is. I don't think of a doctor as a male, and I'm not sure who, how many people do these days think of doctors as men, but what the, the gender specialists continually take all these worst attributes, all these sexist assumptions, and they essentialize them. So for example, what you are actually doing is taking all the terrible attributes, you know, women are powerless, women are this, women are that, men are dominant, men are sexist, women are you know, weak, women are poor, etc., etc. women are untrained, and you essentialize them and pretend that they're accurate, and these are the definitions that are applied. These, mm -hmm. are, these are wrong, these are false, and they are uh, outdated and certainly not relevant in the 21st century, uh, okay. in the UK and the US. And very finally, so you get around that by turning around and saying uh, use of generics. So the use of generics, you say, well, you can do it because most women are this or most women are that. But the only generics that you seem to allow are generics that suit your position. So to give an example, those types of okay. things, but you can't utilize a generic that doesn't suit you. So if you take, say, the president okay. of Harvard University, what he, when he basically said, you know, utilizing a sociological study, that, Got that it. say men, men are better at maths than women, you won't allow it, and then that guy gets sacked. So these, the use of generics is just appalling. So I'd like to make two points. Firstly, the first point's going to sound a bit ridiculous, but there's a lot to do with ethnicity and race, in fact, to do with gender that a lot of people overlook. There's like in ancient India, they recognised a third gender, and in, the ancient, in ancient America, they had multiple genders, and they had the two-spirit people, which were, yeah, which they saw as important people in society. And a lot of that, due to the cultural genocides of what happened when colonisation took place, the European ideology that there was only femininity and masculinity in society took over that and somehow washed it out, which is why we have that idea of gender engraved in our heads from this European view that is now worldwide about gender. And secondly, the 71 genders on Facebook thing. I don't think it's a bad thing. I think that, like the guy over there said, we're making up new genders each week. We aren't we aren't making up genders each week, we're making up labels for genders each week. We're making up descriptions for things that some people actually do feel and we do not, well, we don't have, we can't look into people's minds and think, oh, that's not how you really feel. You cannot feel a certain way because of what I personally see gender as. Okay. And the 71 genders thing okay. isn't necessarily Got it. bad. One more point that was in the same row as you. Yeah, go ahead, you. Um, yep. My question is nowadays that there are so many stereotypes and kind of conceptions about gender that are being shut down and challenged. Um, like, so you don't have, you can be a man without being masculine, you can be a female without being feminine. So do you think there's a chance that like in the future, the, like the notion of gender will just become completely redundant? Okay, I'll let the panel come back on things. Um, Kevin directed a question at me. I'm going to take the bull by the horns and put the cards on the table. Um, so the number of referrals to gender identity clinics in this country going up massively, is that due to something uh, intrinsic to people's biology? I very much suspect not. Unfashionably, for someone who works uh, in, in f who does work related to genetics and so on, I think very little of human behavior and cognition is genetically uh, foreclosed. And I, I think cognition and behaviour in general is very contingent, historically contingent. I don't think there's many trans-historical, natural, scientific, tr eternal truths about it. So I think something else is going on. That's not to be uncompassionate to people for whom, as Chrissy said, uh, transition may be the most uh, a compassionate option to offer. I'm very conscious that in this, you know... This is a long discussion going back into the 20th century. The most prominent trans woman in this country, I think, has just turned 90 and wrote the, book, uh, wrote, uh, uh, the, the important book on this subject in the early 1970s. However, something has changed, and there's a difference between a, an accident of socialisation uh, resulting in a situation where the most compassionate thing to do is to offer uh, uh, medical help to someone and a situation where the assumption that, that that might happen, that someone might need to transition, is baked into socialization and child rearing. I think that might produce a very different uh, set of outcomes. 
And if we, people want something to disagree about, I think we should be talking about whether we think that's a good state of affairs or a bad state of affairs or something we should do something about or not. I've abused my chair's prerogative, but hopefully I've taken some heat off you, Robin. But feel free, <laughs> feel free to jump in anyway. Go on. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm going to try and answer a couple of the questions sort of together. But um, so, and following on from this, I mean, there are, you know, there are papers published with statistics which say things like... Um, if you look at the proportion of people who are, let's say, non-heterosexual, uh, non then it's, it's been constant about 5%, and it's 5% in pretty much all societies. Mm -hmm. So um, that in itself argues that there's probably some biological basis for it, because otherwise, if it was influenced by society really a lot, then you would expect a much wider variation. But the problem is that, well, okay, the issue is that it's, it's often really, really hard to study um, in a scientific way issues to do with gender. And it's hard uh, because of political reasons. Often it's difficult to get funding. It's difficult to get individuals to participate in studies where you are going to look at details of their genetics, et cetera, et cetera. Because, of course, they're suspicious of why you want to do the study. Is it because you want to find, I want to find the cause of, you know, I want to find the gay gene because I, then, I, then I have a cure for you. And that's, that's the sort of thing that people get very nervous about, of course, quite understandably. So it's, it's the whole field is very difficult to study. Um, but it doesn't mean that there isn't a biological basis for things just because it's difficult to study. Uh, it, doesn't mean there, it, it doesn't mean that it's not, uh, there are not other causes uh, because it's difficult to study. So it could be a mix of things. And um, yeah. where was I going to go with this? Uh, it look, get, you get lots of answers if you look at evolution as well. And so don't, don't, you know, it's not just humans on this planet. There are lots of, lots of animals. And you can find pretty much every example of um, different things going on, including... Uh, perfectly natural sex changes occurring in species of fish, for example, where, you, mm -hmm. where they, they, they always go from uh, female to male or from male to female, or some just alternate seemingly at random. Some, uh, in, some, in some fish species, you'll have, they're all female except one male. If that male dies or swims away, the, the, the largest female simply notices that there isn't a male around mm -hmm. and she changes and becomes male. Okay, okay. So anything happens in biology. Okay. Terry, you were effectively accused of some form of projection. You essentialized gender. You asserted that when we think of surgeons, we think of a man. Was that all coming from you? <laughs> That's, I'm, I'm summarizing the point uh, from, the, from the floor. I was really describing rather than endorsing the views uh, there, but... Uh, yeah, sure. The use of generics is appalling, but the use of generics has been something that's been done by institutions. And my point was that it's been justified with reference to nature as though it were inevitable, uh, when in fact uh, it's down to agency. Uh, what forms that has to take? Well, that's up to us. And I'm not saying that all women are victims, or have to be victims, or all men have to be sexist patriarchs. Um, okay. Sorry. Marilyn, you were asked whether questioning gender or being trans or what have you is, is the, the rebellion of our age, the, the way the youth are kicking now. Yes, and I guess behind that question is the notion, is it just a rebellion? In other words, are, are we just cultural dupes as we've always been? Well, of course, we're cultural players, as we've always been, and one would hope that every generation would have its rebellion. So from that point of view, I would take take even that the putting the rebellion into a cultural context is quite positive. Mm -hmm. But the other thing um, that, that, that um, hinges on this, and there were several questions again that, re that brought up the, the notion of identity, that one of the changes that there has been is that having first rebelled by separating sex and gender, these two things have then collapsed when one talks in terms of personal identity simply because of the role that the body has in our Western notions of selfhood. And therefore, it seems to me that any project of self-fashioning, and that is what, um, uh, what, 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 people, what people do all the time, is going to consider gender in, ter in, in those terms. And, and as, a, as a, a, a project for oneself, I have no problems with it whatsoever. Chrissy? 
Uh, yeah, uh, I'd pick up on the two spirit thing first of all because um, I think that Facebook says be very very careful if you identify as two spirit that you're not appropriating a Native <laughs> American uh, identity, which is interesting because uh, f from my understanding uh, there were lots of different um, in, in traditional pre-colonial Native American society, there were lots of different um, ways of, of um, anthropological systems of, of, um, of gender. Two-spirit, I think, only apply to the Navajo Nation. I might have got the wrong, the wrong one. And that, so now all Native Americans now. are appropriating the system of, of one particular um, Native tribe. Uh, also, it's, uh, it's worth pointing out that in many of these um, pre-modern societies, um, non male, female, third, third gender, whatever you want to call it, was not self-selecting. It was often that um, they had a particular role in, in, in relation to the gods and goddesses, and they were selected at birth. You know, you didn't actually choose to be, uh, to be two-spirit, necessarily. It's interesting that two-spirit does t tell us there are two genders. It, it says that there are male and female, and I agree with that. You know, and I don't think there is a problem that because there are if, or if we accept there are only two genders, that that necessarily means people who don't fit all that easily into that are being problematised as people. I don't see that, that that follows. A couple of questions to the panel. Some advice on a practical problem. I run an abortion service, British Pregnancy Advisory Service, and traditionally um, abortion clinics have been seen as treating women. Consequently, the literature refers to women and also with female pronouns and we're under an increasing amount of pressure to change that language um, to be non-gendered, to talk about pregnant persons. Um, I regard this as being an element of virtue signalling really which I think doesn't correspond with the reality. We have had our first dude patient the attitude was well you treat them as an individual like anybody else with their own particular needs and backgrounds but I wonder what the panel thinks about that okay. the other thing I just want to quickly throw in is I just wonder why you think it is that sexual identity has just become so important to the point where young people seem to identify their identity before they've even actually started to practice. You know, mm. I am a pansexual before I've actually had sex with anyone. And I mean, call me old fashioned and just old, but it's like, I think most of us probably spend more time drinking coffee than we have having sex. But there's an element that you don't stress out about whether you're a flat white or whether you're a skinny latte. And I just wonder at what point yeah. sexual preference has just become such an identifying, consuming thing. OK, two final points in the front row. Make them espressos. <laughs> I'd like to suggest that the proliferation of gender identity is actually a new form of conformism. And I base that on the fact that it has been embraced um, so quickly um, by institutions, um, by colleges. I mean, at the college in the town where I live, they start every term by requesting that each student f specify their gender pronoun. Now, if that's, you know, if that doesn't uh, encourage you to conform, I don't know what does. Okay, and the final point? Oh. Uh, hopefully this will give you something to uh, disagree with. My view is that, um, you know, particularly the categorization of non-binary uh, is a, a kind of an individual nihilistic attack on society, on a society that doesn't understand me. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, consequently it's you know, destructive both for the individual who uh, goes down that road but also destructive for society and I believe it's destructive for society because we are you know, creators of meaning you know, we are cultural players, I think mm -hmm. you're right Professor Strathlin um, and so that when we try and frustrate uh, meaning in that way uh, you know, in order to confound society that, that is in front of us uh, then it's a kind of, a, a, you know an attempt to confound society and is destructive of the individual themselves. Okay. I'm going to ask each speaker to offer a concluding thought. They can refer to anything that's just been raised, gender questions in, in context of abortion, in the context of conformism, uh, and whether being non-binary uh, is ultimately a nihilistic 
statement or, uh, or attack on oneself and on society. Uh, and I'll get people to offer their closing thought in the same order as which they give their initial introductions. So, Robin, over to you. The whole topic is incredibly complex. It's, it's a complex topic for, for many reasons. The biology is really complex. We are starting to learn more about aspects of the biology. We, we don't know enough. We know a lot about how, um, say, physical sex differences arise. But we actually still don't... I mean, there are physical sex differences in the brain, of course, and we don't know how, how necessarily how those arise. Um, some of them probably due to effects of hormones, um, but probably not all. A lot is due to reinforcement. It's very difficult to do the biology to actually understand where those differences come from. Are they, is it a cause or a consequence? So do you see a different pattern of tracts connecting you know, one part of the brain connecting with another because of a basic innate biological difference between males and females, or because, because once you become male or female, you start using different pathways? And that is a very interesting topic to, to study. Yep. Um, there are, of course, lots of new techniques uh, coming about and new things we can do. I mentioned some tricks about, um, you know, we can change an ovary to a testis or vice versa. You can do things like womb transplants. Um, you, you know, you could have men going to an abortion clinic because they yeah. had a womb. So we, we have to, I think, be just as flexible about our, our approach to all of this as people are in terms of how they define themselves. Thank you. Uh, Marilyn. Okay, very quickly, a pregnant person, um, every revolution has its, has its costs. We might get into absurdities. That's no reason for not trying to be somewhere else than we are now, than where we are now. And uh, secondly, non-binary is an attack on society. Uh, yes, it may well be, but what I was trying to do was to shift the debate as to how we think about our relations with other entities, and if one puts one's self ecologically situated and starts thinking cross-species and starts thinking about the world at large, um, uh, we, might, we might want to debate that issue of non-binarism. Terry? Okay, I just want to pick up on this idea of that um, the whole idea of being trans or non-binary, that it might be a regressive and not a progressive concept. Um, I tend to agree. The gender dysphoric person sort of finds himself in the wrong body. Wrong. Wrong according to whom or what. Um, that feeling first arises, of course, in a society that is, as I said, steeped with gender stereotypes already. So there could be any number of reasons why the person feels that they're in the wrong body, and these would be, I would argue, are cultural reasons um, of a misfit between the cultural expectations of how someone with my genitals is supposed to behave and my ability to do that. Now, there might be any variety of reasons, uh, but I think I can think of quite a few that don't have anything to do with an intrinsic, innate quality in my body uh, such as the fact that I'm an individual who just can't conform to two very huge generic generalizations. Another could be that I'm body dysmorphic. Another could be that I'm homosexual and gender is always described as a heterosexual, or assumed to be a heterosexually, it's sort of intrinsic in the whole idea of gender, of being male, being female, that you are heterosexual. Mm -hmm. And maybe also you feel this way because you're on the... Um, autism spectrum. Maybe you have Asperger's and you're not quite clear about what's expected of someone like you um, in terms of how to behave in the correct gendered way. Okay. We've swapped one spectrum for another. <laughs> Chrissy, last word. Okay. Um, I thought it was interesting, the final two points from the audience. One, one person saying it's a new conformism, the other person saying it's a destructive nihilistic impulse. And how can those both be true at the same time? And I think they actually are. Because on the one hand, one thing no one's uh, really brought up very much is, is the whole area of queer theory, which is all intermingled with this, which is basically um, the idea that society c creates these categories. They're always on stage. It's like a tapestry, which has got a clear picture on the front. But what queer theorists want to do is turn it round at the back and unpick all the knots so the whole thing falls to pieces, which strikes me as a very nihilistic sort of um, uh, approach, really. It's like the uh, 19th century anarchists dropping bombs everywhere in the hope that suddenly society will become a, a peacefully utopia uh, mm -hmm. seems quite unlikely but how can that 
coexist with the new conformism? I would say because there is no objective behind this. There's, there's no, there is a movement of, we want to do something, we want to make society different in some way, <laughs> but there's no clear sense of what the future holds. And that brings to, to, to my final point, yep. which is what these seemingly contradictory positions have in common is a deep contempt, I think, for the vast majority of ordinary people who simply don't have any problem with, with male and female. OK. Uh, very finally, I'd like to thank, again, the sponsors of this strand. That's International Business Times. I'd like to thank the people helping out here in the room. That's the Barbican hosts. It's the Battle of Ideas volunteers running around with, with microphones. It's the World Right volunteers who are doing the filming. And most of all, I'd like to thank our four wonderful speakers. Give them a round of applause. <laughs>